Good morning, Paula. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm okay. I'll be glad when this cold is gone, but I'm okay. Oh, right. <laughs> Your yeah, chicken to... pen's looking good. Thank you. I actually, I have I have most of a roof on it now. I'm hoping to get the roof done today before I head back to Huntsville. So, do you just have two chickens, or have you added to it? Well, so we only had two. Three came with the house, but <laughs> we have two, and um, we just got a shipment of baby birds. So we have we currently have eight of babies, and we're going to give um, three are going to Christina, and so. By the time we're done, we'll have seven total. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So, and there are it's a there are a variety of different ones. So we've got um, Easter uh, eggers, Easter eggers an, an australorps, australorps, and a, a well summer, and a well summer. And then we'll, our, our old ones are a golden comet and a leghorn. Well, so. jo uh, Joanna and Trevor have about fifty, I would guess. Oh and yeah. They've probably got 10 different varieties, and mm -hmm. one of them has this, I want to call it hair, these feathers that are just sticking up and down again. They are so <laughs> weird. <laughs> I did not know chickens could be as pretty as some of them are. Yeah, there's a big variety. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. Hey, Robert. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Camille. Hey, Camille. Yeah, it's been fun though. The the working on the coop has been good therapy this week. So, you know, doing something with my hands and being outside feels feels really good. So Yeah, that's why I'm excited about it warming up. That's my therapy is when I can get out in the yard and use my hands to dig around in dirt. <laughs> Spring arrived very suddenly here on Friday. Uh, oh, you know, it just—it suddenly it. felt like, oh, it's nice. And so yesterday we were working out in the yard, getting things ready, and it was just—it was so nice. Well, I think it went down to twenty-nine here yesterday. <laughs> oh, this weather's getting scary. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, we um, uh, I left the, I left the chicken coop open accidentally last night and uh when i came out this morning they were gone and so i was scared <laughs> it came around they were they were hanging out on our front porch so <laughs> they're trying to tell you hey dave dave mm. you left the coop open last night yeah yeah that's right they're like dummy <laughs> lock your doors dave joanna and trevor got a few guinea hands that they eventually got rid of because you could not keep them in a coop. Camille says chickens make good guard dogs. I've heard that. Not ours, but I'm sure some do. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Melissa. Hey, Miller. Hi, Miller. Hi there. We have an unusual number of cats on these broadcasts, <laughs> <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> Much very much like a house church. It very much is. <laughs> Today is this one's one year anniversary of coming home, and I think she knows it. Oh, she's been on a while birthday. this morning. Tony's not able to join us today, um, so. Uh, Melissa, would you mind being the liturgist? Sure. Okay. And we'll do the keep the same roles. Other than that, um, the I will tell you that the both scripture readings are really long today, so they're both like most of a chapter. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of my one of my favorite stories. And um, actually, they're both some of my favorite stories. Uh, Y'all ready to get started? 
Yes. Let me see if I can. Okay, all my all my windows have moved around. Pardon me. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Ready when you are. Morning, everyone. 20 years ago, on this day in 2003, President George W. Bush ordered the U.S. military to begin airstrikes on Baghdad. This war was justified in the media to the citizens of the U.S. on the false pretense that Saddam Hussein was pursuing the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction. The war would go on to cost $2.4 trillion and around a quarter of a million Iraqi lives. 20 years later, many Americans still believe the false narrative about weapons of mass destruction. In 2006, the North Alabama Conference of the United Methodist Church, when presented with a resolution calling for peace, changed the resolution into a declaration of support for the Iraq war in violation of the social principles. In 2019, when presented with an opportunity to repudiate the earlier support, the majority of the North Alabama Conference reaffirmed its support for the Iraq war and the lies upon which it was perpetrated. In 2009, the Pentagon estimated that as many as 360,000 360, U.S. veterans of the Iraq War may have had traumatic brain injuries, and a 2020 report estimates death by suicide amongst veterans in the post-9-11 wars to be 30,177. March 19th or 20th is also the feast day of St. Joseph, and in Spain it is celebrated as Father's Day, since Joseph of Nazareth is a model of fatherhood. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear these words of invitation. The hospitality of God knows no bounds. The love of God is immeasurable. The generosity of God is beyond our wildest dreams. We gather today as invited ones. As beloved ones. As blessed ones. Draw near and let us break the bread of life. A reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. 1 Samuel 16, 1-13 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have found my next king among his sons. How can I do that? Samuel asked. When Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replies, and say, I have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will make clear to you what you should do. You will anoint for me the person I point out to you. Samuel did what the Lord instructed. When he came to Bethlehem, the city leaders came to meet him. They were shaking with fear. Do you come in peace, they asked. Yes, Samuel answered. I've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now make yourselves holy, then come with me to the sacrifice. Samuel made Jesse and his sons holy and invited them to the sacrifice as well. When they arrived, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, that must be the Lord's anointed right in front. But the Lord said to Moses, have, said to Samuel, have no regard for his appearance or stature because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. Next, Jesse called for Abinadab, who presented himself to Samuel, but he said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. So Jesse presented Shema, but Samuel said, no, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't picked any of these. 
Then Samuel asked Jesse, is that all of your boys? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's out keeping the sheep. Send for him, Samuel told Jesse, because we can't proceed until he gets here. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was reddish brown, had beautiful eyes, and was good looking. The Lord said, that's the one, go anoint him. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him right there in front of his brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. Then Samuel left and went to Ramah. John 9, 1 through 41. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the, men went, so the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. And others said, no, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He answered, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told him, you put mud on my eyes. I washed and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he's a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he see now? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he sees and we don't know how, who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard that they expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? He answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who, will be, who, sorry, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say, we see, 
your sin remains. May God bless the hearing of this word. Thanks be to God. Frederick Buchner writes about war. Can there be any doubt that if the fighting were left to the leaders themselves, the story would be a very different one? One pictures them in their business suits and long dresses, their burnooses and caftans and saris, as they head off to do it armed with weapons they have no idea how to use, and ultimatums, principles, and slogans that suddenly seem equally useless and with their hearts in their mouths. Can there be any question as to how long it would take it would take them to turn around and go home? Can there be any doubt that Jesus was speaking only a simple truth when he said that those who live by the sword will die by the sword? So thank you all for getting us started uh, in worship today. And uh, thank thanks to those of you who are tuning in, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube. If you are on social media, Facebook or YouTube, if you would like to participate in our um, community prayer, Feel free just to type something in the comments, and we will read it out as we pray. Um, also, if you are on, if you are streaming, um, if you don't mind clicking like or just leaving a comment with where you're watching from, that gives us a way to count you. Um, and uh, thanks again for for being with us today. Um, I will look at YouTube for comments. Will someone would someone be willing to look at Facebook for comments? Thanks, thanks, Melissa. All right, let's go to God in prayer. God, in the strange liminal time between winter and spring, when the temperature shifts dramatically, when one day seems to bear witness to new life and another seems to say, wait, not yet, we're reminded of how often we sit poised on the boundary of things. We feel that this age, the time that we're living in, is a liminal space, that we are at a boundary or a crossroads. Help us to act with wisdom and peace and love so that whatever path we choose or whatever boundary we cross, we know we are going from blessing to blessing. We lift up to you all those who are struggling right now who don't know what tomorrow may bring who are worried about the future, whether that's because of health or money or conflict. We lift them up to you and ask for your healing. We're reminded by the story today that troubles do not necessarily come because of any kind of deserving, but that Jesus looks at them as opportunities to demonstrate grace. We have a hard time understanding, God, the purposes, the goals, the whys and wherefores of suffering. Sometimes, Lord, we know it's simply suffering. Help us to engage it with peace and a healing attitude. We lift up to you the world and its brokenness. We pray about the reality of climate change and war and things <clears throat> that seem too big for us. But we know that nothing is too big for you. And we lift up to you names and situations of people who are close to us. We also lift up to you our praise and celebrations, recognizing your goodness shines through in so many circumstances. I invite those of you who are listening to share your prayers. For Donald Champion and her family. Lord, hear our prayer. Gratitude for an easy toe surgery for Ruth Weaver and prayers for quick and easy healing. Lord, hear our prayer. Healing for Ward Watson and Annie Wright. Lord, hear our prayer. For Kristen Holder and L. Hoer. Lord, hear our prayer.
for transgender children and their doctors. Lord, hear our prayer. In gratitude for the rain and for the protection of those who are affected by the might of the storms. Lord, hear our prayer. Gratitude for life on the eve of my 40th birthday. Lord, hear our prayer. Gratitude for new friends and for reconnecting with old ones. Lord, hear our prayer. Camille's mom and aunt. Lord, hear our prayer. Or Victoria and Oliver. Lord, hear our prayer. Gratitude for time to spend with friends. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious God, for all that you do and all that you share with us, for the fact that you hear our prayers and that you answer, we give you thanks. And we join with Jesus and the prayer that he taught us. Holy One, our mother and father, let your name be revered. Let your reign come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in the heavens. Give us today the bread we need for today. And forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the sovereignty, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. So I want to share a little bit about this story um, that we just read. And, and the first place that my mind goes uh, with regard to the John story, the, the healing of the man born blind, the first place my mind goes. And part of this is just because I'm in the thick of working on a master's degree in counseling. Um, and so this hard, it's hard for me to escape thinking about this way, is the way that families and communities and churches and systems like stability, like they don't like change. Now, in a healthy system, a healthy family, a healthy church, a healthy community, you're ev everyone feels supported by the group. Everyone feels like this group's got my back. Like I'm trying to grow. I want to change. There's I have goals in my life, and these people are supporting me. Right? I mean, that's the way we want to feel in our churches. That's the way we want to feel in our families. We want to feel like people have our back, right? And they're helping us get to where we want to go. In this situation, you've got someone who's born blind, and the immediate question the disciples ask Jesus is, whose fault is this? Because obviously, it's got to be somebody's fault. And I can't tell you, I mean, I, I know, I know instantly, like when we hear that, we're like, oh, how ridiculous. And yet, it is so easy to fall into the trap of deserving. Someone whose voice we don't really, we only hear a tiny bit about his parents, but I think about his mom. And when her son was born blind, how she probably thought it was her fault. Because I've talked to enough people to know that oftentimes when that kind of thing happens, parents feel like they screwed up. Somehow we blew it. And I can imagine even like today, someone would say, oh, she, did she eat the wrong thing? Did she take drugs? What was her problem? What did she do? 
What should, what should we do to deserve it? And, and even, even if we know better, we, we fall into that trap, right? We fall into the deserving trap. And somehow we build this theology of deserving around things. And it, it, it permeates everything. It permeates how we think, how we talk about uh, social services for the poor, right? It talks about, it, it permeates how we think about education, how we think about housing. If only those people would get off drugs, then they could find a place to live, right? Most people who are homeless are out there because they just won't work or because they're addicted or something along those lines. We, we have this theology of deserving that we carry with us. Even, even if we know better, it's hard to shake it off. It permeates everything. And back in the day, it was even stronger, right? We often tend to this idea that um, if something wasn't meant to be, that God would have stopped it. Uh, we struggle with the idea of deserving of why God lets bad things happen. And I'm not going to get into all that today, but I do feel like that's kind of lying behind this thing. It's informing the whole story. This idea of this is just the way things are meant to be. I find it interesting that Jesus, who had the power to heal people and who was intimately connected to God, prayed to God, let your will be done which indicates that there are some things that happen that aren't in God's will. I mean, otherwise, why would you pray for that? Why would you bother praying for God's will to be done? So Jesus has this response to the disciples when they say, who does, who deserved this? What, what happened that he deserved this? Jesus's reply, he, he doesn't really address the, the theodicy question about why bad things happen, but he says, no one send. This is an opportunity for us to demonstrate God's grace. Okay. Then he heals the guy. There's a lot. I mean, there's so much meat in here. I, I wish I could go into all of it, but I can't, right? So he spits on the ground, makes mud, puts on the guy's eyes. This is very much like Genesis creation, like forming the man out of mud, all that stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of theological meat here. Okay, so he goes and washes. This is also like Naaman the Syrian from the Old Testament. Like I said, there's so much stuff. I can't go into all of it. But so then he comes back and he can see, and there's this amazing dialogue. His healing doesn't immediately make people go, wow, this is amazing. Congratulations. Instead, it causes consternation. Like everyone's upset that this guy got healed. Some of it's about why, how Jesus went about healing him. He worked on the Sabbath. Some of it's about the character of this, of the healer. The man's integrity is questioned. His parents are brought in. It, there's all this turmoil around the healing. This is not something that we often see in, in other healing stories in the New Testament. Oftentimes, someone gets healed, they you know, take up your mat and walk. Guy picks up his bed and he skips around. Oh, yay, I'm done. And like, that's the end of it. The healing is the miracle. In this, the healing is just the beginning of all the other crap. And it really shines a light on how people often prefer an unjust, stable system to one that's unstable and where healing and justice is happening. I mean, this guy is set free. Now, and I, I want to share also, this is like even modern science talks about, like someone born blind, they, they've never developed the neural pathways to actually understand sight. Now, if you lose your sight and you can somehow fix something, people can sometimes see but if you never learn if your if your neurons don't form in the uh to to give you vision what how how does that even work this isn't just an eye problem right i mean we know this is a this is a brain problem modern science would be like someone born blind can see so when jesus does this healing it is it is mind blowing this is this would be miraculous even by today's standards and so many people are unhappy about it. I mean, I think about, 
I think about sometimes families, someone who has had a substance use problem suddenly gets sober and then the family's upset about it or someone, uh, someone gets free in another way. Someone comes out as LGBTQ and people are upset about it. So this person's free and they're feeling better because they're being honest, but uh, we got to, we got to clamp down on this. This is, this is an issue, right? So many times social systems, families, communities, churches clamp down on liberation and on healing in part, I think, because it disrupts our theology of deserving. Who deserves this? I think it goes against the, the hierarchies we have in mind. That's it's really focuses on the leaders, but I, I suspect that there's even, even more than just the leaders, even more than just the people in power. I bet, I bet this disturbed a lot of things. So the story goes on, and I, I love the way the man who has been healed just keeps drawing back to the facts. <laughs> he just keeps coming back to the specifics. I don't know. I don't know who he is. I don't know what your concerns with power are. This is what I know. I was blind. Now I'm healed. Right? He keeps coming back to the facts. His parents keep coming back to the facts. I love the fact that they say, he's old enough. He can speak for himself. Right? I mean, the, the leaders are trying to get the parents. They're trying to recruit them to, to reinforce the stable system that they had before. And his parents are like, talk to him. And he says, I don't know. Talk to Jesus. Like, they're not getting recruited into this system of oppression. And I also wonder, in our modern situation, <clears throat> if we could be as honest and forthright as that, to recognize the power dynamics at play, and then just to say, I'm not going to play that game. The man even, he, I love the fact that he gets a little sarcastic dig in there. He says, I, I don't know. Do you want to be his disciples? You want me to go, you want me to make an introduction? Right. And and then they're furious because he's directly challenged their power. So it ends finally, the you know, Jesus comes to him. He's been kicked out of the worshiping community. And Jesus comes and says, What happened? And you know, the man explains the situation. And then Jesus welcomes him. Okay, you can you can be part of this this new community that I'm building. And the last line is the leaders um, say, we're not blind, are we? And Jesus, without even really saying, yes, you're blind, he says, you know, if you, if you weren't blind, uh, I mean, if you were blind, you'd have an excuse. But because you're perfectly aware of what's going on, you don't have any excuse. I hear that as judgment on all the systems that we have that are so stable and keep people from being free. Like once you know what's going on, once you understand power, once you understand theology, if you say you know Jesus, now, now you're on the hook, right? Now you know how this stuff works. And so you have a choice of whether you're going to participate in it or not participate in it. I think that's where I'm going to stop. I actually have more I'd like to say, but I'm going to put a pin in it. And uh, I would love to hear your comments and responses to this story. Dave, um, 20 years ago, I got to go up to Harvard for a few weeks and study the Enneagram with a Catholic priest there named Rich Byrne uh, with a group of people. And we spent an entire week talking about uh, becoming healthier mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and how to recognize when we were moving to a bad place and what to do to move to a healthier place. Wonderful week. And then at the end of the week, Rich ended it by Oh, man, I'm on the hook. <laughs> I think Paul is frozen. I want to grab a couple of comments out of the chat and see if Please she do. comes back. Um, I've got one from Facebook. Um, 
Victoria says, you spoke today on exactly what our family lives as parents of a disabled teen. You spoke exactly of how our society and the church treats our family. From the book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request. Oh, mm. sharing a quote from the book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request. People who like to comfort themselves with the idea that disability does not exist in new creation are centering their ableist discomfort in someone else's story, in my mm. story. My disability is not for others to write. My body is not an empty canvas on which non-disabled people can paint their fantasies of new creation. Even if our bodies are not disabled in new creation, why does that make someone so thrilled? When we worship God, we shouldn't harm people who bear God's image. Surely we can find something to praise about the creator of the universe that doesn't erase disabled people. Worship should not create a hierarchy of who is in and who is out. Worship should not laud a utopia without your disabled neighbor. Dang. A word. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're done Everyone yeah, go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so good thank you for sharing that like um i love oh paula's back paula oh you're back paula oh no. <laughs> um here i'll read camille's comment mm. the parents of the blind man threw their son under the bus because they don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue they said ask him knowing that he'll probably be kicked out of jewish community i mean i i do love that this is an example of, of jesus circling back and being like hey dude are you okay you know yeah <laughs> because you do wonder like there are moments where uh like he does something like miraculous and amazing to somebody and then you're like are they okay <laughs> right how are they living yeah mm -hmm. so, like there's there's aftercare <laughs> uh, yeah aftercare is an important thing here i'm glad you're back paula I, you had you dropped off right where you were telling about um the enneagram and what you guys learned <laughs> Okay, uh, we talked about what we needed to do to move to a more healthy place and what we needed and when to recognize when we weren't in a healthy place. And at the end of the week, Rich said, okay, now that you know all the basics, you also need to know this. When you decide to make the changes in your life to move to a more healthy place, all hell is going to break out. And it did. <laughs> uh no, uh, families are amazing at how they will fight change in any one family member. And it's also heartbreaking because it's one of those things that keep us stuck in a system because we don't want to upset the people that we love, mm -hmm. even when it's necessary for our health and for theirs too, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I can... Okay, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> thank, I don't thank need you to for get too that, personal. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing that. No, I, I think I think that's something that we do see, and I think this is a. I mean, the story illustrates it. But yes, when someone starts getting healthy, sometimes someone else go, jumps up and nope, not yet. Yeah, yeah, Rob. This so I, I want to I want to read this this comment from the the chat here, and then. Uh, <laughs> It's funny because I'm just thinking about this, this theme of erasure, okay? I mean, you know, Victoria brought it up here in the, in the chat on, on Zoom. Miriam says, as 95% uh, blind in today's world and getting blinder as I age, often cited people's compliment is, I can't tell you're blind. <laughs> I just think, oh, what, a, what a heartbreaking erasure of your, your lived experience, you know, that uh, and so, so apropos of what Paul is saying and your observation, Dave, I'm just thinking about the fact that like part of stability, uh, part of the established system and not rocking the boat is the ability to ignore what you want to ignore uh, or go on blaming who you want to blame, saying people deserve what you expect they deserve, right? This runs right through phenomena of like when somebody in a family is just the goat and they can do nothing right and people blame them for everything and they never enjoy, you know, we don't celebrate their success or anything. Um, even when objectively there'd even be all these reasons, right? It's just, no, you're not allowed to be happy about your life. We've decided to hate you, right? Mm -hmm. There's that, that's an active erasure. 
And so I'm just thinking about when, like when Jesus heals this person, um, you know, when, when, when somebody is enjoying something, something has changed for them and they're happy about it. Uh, then all of a sudden it's like, well, no, wait a minute. No, no, no. We can't have that. We don't want, you're not, no, the, the stability is that you're supposed to be miserable and that's what we're used to. Mm-hmm. The stability is we get to ignore you, right? The, st- the stability is we get to ignore um, your illness or, or whatever it is, right? We don't have to worry about your mental health because no, we, whatever you deserve, whatever happened to you and you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, I just see this, this, this onion with all these layers of just erasure upon erasure. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Melissa. Comment and Rob's comments. So Miriam's comment of someone saying like, I can't tell you're blind. It sounded at what I heard also was like, Oh, I don't see your race or mm-hmm. an experience I had of several times when I came out last year as bisexual it was I had several people tell me I never would have known that you were bi as if that was supposed to be a compliment. Um, Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking is like how much macro systems want to homogenize people Mm -hmm. and for it to be a compliment. Oh, you fit right in. You blended right into this sort of whitewashed uh, expectation that we have for all people and how, how that's supposed to be a compliment. Like what a good job you did, you little soldier, you know, falling right into line um, as opposed to what you're really saying is, I never saw you for who you are. That's, and it's a good thing that I didn't. And like, what a backhanded mm. insult that actually is in, within the system. Yeah. I, I reminds me both Rob and Melissa, that I, that idea. And again, using the, the metaphor, uh, the ableist metaphor of sight, I don't see you. Right. Um, that uh, there, I can't remember. I can't remember which greeting it is. There's a particular, Greeting, I I want to say it's Swahili, but it's uh, I I see you is actually the greeting, um, and and what a what a statement I guess really for the community to say I see you, and in your lived experience, I don't ignore you. Yeah, yeah, Paula. I think you can see the same thing playing out in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible story of David. Uh, Samuel goes to the father and says, you know, one of your sons is meant for greatness. Bring them all to me. And the family expectation was, well, David's a runt and he's not good for anything except keeping sheep. So don't even bother with him. So they brought out all the leadership material before. And then Samuel had to actually ask to see David they weren't even going to bring him out after Simon after Samuel rejected everybody else we put our family members in slots like that Uh, this is what I expect of you and don't step out of that box Mm -hmm. and when someone does uh yeah there's going to be trouble (laughs) yeah thank you for that yeah Miller go ahead Back to what Rob and um, uh, Melissa were talking about the, uh, it was, uh, sorry, they're making us, <laughs> the, uh, it was, um, <laughs> the cat, okay. I, I see you, cat. I, I see you, cat. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I keep thinking about, like, this, this sort of assumption of norms, you know, the fact that there is a norm and that exists. I think of like, you know, somebody saying, oh, I'm fat. And they're like, oh, you're not fat. You're beautiful. You know, like, like, like there's no way to be, you know, both of those things. And there's no, and the, and the fact that, that like being fat is like, you know, some kind of a swerve from what you should be. Um, There's also, I also can't help but think about how like, this is something good that happened to this person in this passage. Like, I mean, he, he seems to be pretty amazed by it and he seems okay with it. Um, and still even, even like that kind of deviation from the norm. Uh, and, and it's like an all episode of like law and order SVU, you know, there's like multiple interrogations. <laughs> and I think it, it scares people that like, 
the I mean, seeing that there is something outside of what you view as the norm uh, is frightening to people. And I guess that's the crime that they're trying to investigate. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Melissa. Show me on the doll where he healed you. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Oh, perfect. Go ahead, Melissa. Of this story. yeah, this, the comments are bringing the heat today. I just want to want to make sure we kept some of these. So on Facebook, Victoria says, "Look at what we're doing in our own to our own state prisoners, eighty percent of whom are disabled. It's all right. It's all right in our face. It's all right in our face. Sorry, Victoria, I'm messing this up. It's all right in our face. What family Christian values mean here? It's mm-hmm. so painful to witness. Yeah. Um, then we've got a couple of Zoom comments that I'll catch as well. Mm-hmm. Bill says. This man is no longer recognized as a blind beggar, meaning he probably won't be able to rely on his community to to support him, but he may not have had any other means to support himself. Mm. I want the sequel because he may have to hang out with the sinners and outcasts of the community. Mm, Good point. And Charissa says, oh, wow, that comment about the parents not wanting to lose their place in the synagogue. Yep. The blind man was already cut out of society. So he should be used to being on the outside. He can answer those, these questions themselves. He can answer these questions themselves Mm. because what's he got to lose? Those with privilege don't even realize sometimes when they're unwilling to take even the small hits for being associated with someone on the outs with society. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Good comment. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Rob. To the, to the point about, you know, conformity and, and homogenization, like, you know, I, so, so what I've seen is when you challenge the idea of some of these norms, right, uh, people get really worked up about the idea that you're challenging something that is super obvious, right, something that is to be taken for granted. And I feel like there's something to be teased apart there because, I mean, okay, yes, when I look around, uh, you know, there's lots of things that are common, but it's still another step of reason to say, and because they are common, they should be the norm, right? And I, I, I feel like we should think about why do we do that? Why, you know, I mean, because like the Vulcan philosophy, I'll just bring in Star Trek, right? Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Right. There's an episode of the original series. It's not a terribly good episode, but it is the one that introduces the founder of, you know, contemporary Vulcan philosophy, Surak. And, and he meets people and says, I am pleased to see that we have differences, mm. which I think is really beautiful. And, and like, oh man, boy, now there is a principle to organize the society around, right? Yes. Mm. Yes. So why can we not have infinite diversity and infinite combinations? Why must we instinctively say we need norms to enforce, right? Mm. Or, I mean, if we're going to enforce norms, why don't we enforce norms about mutual care and respect and the dignity of all living things, right? Mm -hmm. Why are our norms, well, you have to fit into this man-shaped box or this woman-shaped box, and it really helps to be white and have money and to have generally the same sensory and bodily abilities as everyone else, then you're great, Mm -hmm. right? Why why would those be the norms that we say, yeah, okay, this is good, and everybody else, well, I don't know, it sucks to be you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And when I, when I think about norms too, I mean, just statistically, you know, here's a bell curve, right? And, but that's one, it's usually one measure. Like if we, if we looked at everybody, very few people fit our, our average everything, right? Some of us, <clears throat> some of us are above average in height or below average in height. And that's a natural diversity. And, you know, there, that if we looked at different kinds of mental skills or, or whatever, you're going to have highs and lows. And most of us, if you take enough measurements of who we are as people, we're going to be, we're going to be one standard deviation beyond in something. Right. And it, it, we're all, that's, I, I think about that kind of difference and yet somehow in our heads, it all gloms together into the average Joe. And like, this is, this is the human. Uh, instead of like you're saying that tremendous range of of everything of 
I, I mean, if, if I start listing things, I could list them forever, right? Um, of all of our different characteristics, um, not to mention life experiences and, and other stuff. But thank you for that. Other thoughts, comments? Thank you also, Paula, for tying this back to the David story. I love it. <laughs> I like finding the, I love finding the connections. Absolutely. They're always more. there. <laughs> yes, they are. There's a couple more good comments in the chat. Um, uh, well, let's see, Miller, you're back. Do you want to read yours and, and do the comments? Sure. Um, well, I was just pointing out that it's not exactly like the blind man was being supported mm. by his family before. <laughs> he was on the beg on the street begging. Um, so <laughs> yeah. that says good something point. about the relationship. <laughs> that does. Good point. Yeah. Their parents are like, why are you talking to us about him? <laughs> we, we kicked we kicked him out years ago. Why are you talking to us? Yeah. yeah. We don't want any trouble. God forbid <laughs> we love our son. Yeah. <laughs> Miriam says, a uh, new friend asking about my personal situation with blindness and looking at all our isms today. She put her hands together next to me, obviously having been born without either of her little fingers, saying, we all have a little something. <laughs> and then uh, Camille says, true Miller, but even though the blind beggar was probably already on the outside, people might have felt some righteousness when they gave him anything to help him. Now, if those uh, same people might be less inclined to show him any humanity because he has been tossed out and they might be guilty by association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could totally see this. I mean, it's the sort of the question about like, you know, why are you poor? You know, it, it's this, that's an investigation that happens regularly. Yeah. You know, what what bad choices are you making that are keeping you poor? And then, by the way, you're also just supposed to be my object of pity so that I can feel good about myself. One of those bad choices is getting an education. Uh, this morning on one of the news channels was a guy talking about the three things you needed to pay off before you retired. And one of them was student debt. Mm -hmm debt you you get in your 20s that you're still paying off in your 60s that's obscene yeah yeah thank you for that well i i want to there, there may be more comments but i want to say thank you for thank you for a rich discussion about this particular topic i i remember in seminary uh i had a um uh, Bill Mallard, who was an amazing uh, teacher, um, gathered us together and we did a um, a drama exegesis of the story of Jesus um, healing the man, the paralyzed man on the mat. And so he, you know, put us in different groups. He's like, "Oh, y'all are the friends who are carrying the guy on the mat. Y'all are the guy on the mat. You guys are the bystanders, and this is Jesus over here." And he had us act out those things and talk in groups about kind of what happens in the story, the consequences of this event, the motivations, like what are we thinking as we as we're tearing a hole in somebody's roof to lower them down to Jesus. And and one of the things I was in the group that was, you know, the the guy's friends, one of the things were like, we're sick of hauling this guy around everywhere. <laughs> like we're getting him healed because we're, you know, and but but like really putting yourself in the story, right? And and then afterwards thinking, you know, now the guy's healed. But what are his skills? What has he been able to do? What has his society trained him to do? And now he's like healed. He's like, oh crap! Now I've got to figure out what to do to make a living. Same same thing here. And I, I appreciate those of you who brought that up. Like if you really put yourself in the story, and you you like you're thinking about, okay, what are the consequences here? What's my motivation? What it it really changes the nature of the story. And I love the fact. Like I think this is the only story in the in the New Testament where we get the aftermath of a healing. And, and I, I do think about that when I'm talking with people as a pastor or in a counseling situation or as a friend, when, when someone like, what is the aftermath of the supposedly good thing? Cause the story's not over. Like the story keeps going <laughs> and, uh, and seeing someone else talked about, uh, I think it may have been Camille talking about wanting this, wanting the sequel. So what's the next thing that happens? Um, yeah, I would love to see the sequel to this. Time for some fanfic. <clears throat> go ahead, go ahead, Rob. 
Well, I just want to pick that up. I mean, because I know this is something that's really important to Miller and, and they were commenting on it to some extent already, right? That like, it's the aftercare part of this, you know? So this guy, yeah, he's without livelihood. And now the community in which he has been eking out his existence on the margins isn't sure what to do with him anymore. Um, so that return by Jesus to say, you should probably come with us, <laughs> right? And that instantiation of like, hey, there is another community, right? Like, yes. I mean, whether whether we view that as a chosen family kind of a thing and the idea of like, hey, different norms operate here, right? We have infinite diversity, and infinite combinations over here and we look after each other. Um, the idea that that's one of the most important things Jesus does, right, is to instantiate that community and give people a place in it. Um, it just feels like we don't want to we don't want to skate past that. Yes, thanks. Thank you for that. Well, again, thank you for a, a very rich discussion. Um, why don't we turn back to the liturgy and um, and close close our time together? Really appreciate all that all that y'all have shared. Julian of Norwich, or a prayer from Julian of Norwich, is my birthday gift, Dave, um, because I am obsessed with her. So awesome. thank you for including that. Um, all right, God, I have been taught that your love is your meaning. I've been taught that love is your meaning in this and in everything. Before you made us, you loved us which love has never abated and never will be. And in this love, you have done all your works. And in this love, you have made all things profitable to us. And in this love, our life is everlasting. Amen. God is love. Nothing is wasted. All things shall be well. Go in peace. Yeah, I, I had Julian right here on my, uh, on my desk. And I was like, okay. Good prayer, right here. <laughs> yes. Love, love, Julian. Um, thanks, uh, thanks everyone who has uh, streamed and been part of our conversation today, been part of our worship. Um, oh yeah, I can I can paste that prayer in the chat. Um, also, if those if you're on the um, on the panel, I may have shared this. Uh, I've got a Google. Um, it's a Google Doc, and I think I share it with y'all. Um, Let's see if I can uh, put that in there. Hang on a second. I'll make it so everyone can see it in the chat. There we go. <clears throat> um, yes, thank you all very much for for your sharing and and for the conversation today. Um, I will I will also say that I um, the twenty year anniversary of the bombing of Baghdad and and the war, uh, which is is important to me. Um, that was one of the first, I guess, two years after I got ordained. Um, it was one of the first votes at annual conference that I was I got to vote in, got to be part of, and it was. And I saw this resolution come that was about peace, and I saw it get changed on the floor to support war. And um, it has always hit me that in the United Methodist discipline, it says very clearly, war is incompatible with the teachings of Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, two sentences later. Especially first strike preemptive actions um, are, you know, that we we don't support that. That that's in the social principles, and for twenty years I've heard people who had no problem voting to support war get really frustrated or get get really angry about the fact that the so that um, some of us object to the idea that the discipline says that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. The only other thing that says is incompatible with Christian teaching is war. It's very clear. And, um, and North Alabama conference voted to support the war in Iraq. So in 2019, I submitted a resolution saying we're going to repudiate this earlier decision. And it was close. It was a close vote, but you know, we live in Alabama. It's an honor shame culture. Uh, war is also, I mean, the 20 years of war in the Middle East has been really good to the economies of Huntsville and Madison. Um, so, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Um, and I think it's important to state the truth. Um, this was, this is incompatible with Christian teaching very clearly. Being gay, I don't think is incompatible with Christian teaching. 
<laughs> just to, I don't, I think that's a pretty lousy statement in the social principles, but for the people who really say you got to follow the social principles, then, then yeah, let's, let's look at all of them. Let's look at all of them and let's put them through the filter of Jesus Christ. And when I read this and I read about healing and I read about the way that power systems uh, conspire to keep stability by not seeing people, by not seeing 250,000 dead Iraqis uh, or the $2 trillion we've spent um, on wars in the Middle East. Yeah, kind of that kind of sticks in my craw a little bit. Um, actually, I didn't really, you didn't bargain on two sermons, but there's my second one for today. Um, so go in the spirit of truth-telling and love of all creation. And uh, really thank thank you all for being part of this system today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the live stream. <clears throat> Those of you on Zoom, if you'd stick around for just a minute more. And this time I won't accidentally push the end.